May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be as pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. So we read Psalm 137. How many of you felt really awkward when we did the response for the last verse? Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the stones. Good! <laughs> I would hope all of us. I'm going to come back to that. So about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, um, there was a movie that was released by DreamWorks called Inside Out. And it's a kid's movie. Sort of. I mean, when Dream, DreamWorks are great storytellers, and when they say it's a kid's movie, what they mean is that it's a movie for human beings that's good for kids to watch as well. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it. Um, it's fantastic. And most of the story takes place inside a 12 or 13 year old's head. And it's this story as she learns to go from being permanently or dominantly joyful to recognizing that sometimes other emotions have richness and value in them as well. And the story is joy inside Riley's head and sadness inside Riley's head go on this adventure and they learn to value each other, particularly the sadness. Wonderful story. Go and watch it. But you might be asking the question, well, what's that got to do with church? A couple of years ago, um, I was at university in South Africa uh, and I was doing engineering and there was this uh, young girl who came from an international school and uh, she was bright and bubbly and friendly and funny and hardworking and nothing like me. And uh, one day I saw her and she was sitting down sort of on the, by the side of the road waiting for a lift I think and she looked tired. And I went and spoke to her and I said, you know, you're always so cheerful. And, and she said, I have to be. You have to be. She says, I'm a Christian. I've got to have joy. It's like, well, basically, the Grinch comes to me for notes as to how to be more Grinchy. So that came as a bit of a shock to me. <laughs> like, you've got to be joyful because you're a Christian. You've got to be permanently cheerful because you're a Christian. Now, if I'd been a better informed Christian, quick plug for Bible studies and study groups there, they're important. If I'd been a better informed Christian, I might have been able to sit her down with, with the reading from Lamentations or, or Psalm 137. Because there are two sides of the same coin, and I want to focus on the psalm. Uh, the psalm is set during the exile in Babylon. So what's happened is the Babylonians... Uh, and possibly the Edomites. So the Edomites are like a subject nation, and in all likelihood the Babylonians use the Edomite soldiers to attack Jerusalem, which is why the Edomites get remembered in the psalm. And they've come into Jerusalem and they've taken anyone with any reasonable skill set. So if you can read and write, which was pretty rare back then, that's it, you're now a slave. Uh, if you uh, scribe, if you know how to count particularly well, um, or if you know music, you're now a slave. And they've been carted off, and they've been marched towards Babylon. And they're remembering this experience where they've been marched all day, all, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the Babylonian captors are bored, and they say to them, Sing us a song from Jerusalem, you know, something bright and happy. We've been marching you all day, and we are tired. They are not in a happy place. They are angry, sad, and bitter. And the first question we should be asking ourselves is, I wonder when we've participated in an action that has quite legitimately made somebody else angry or sad or bitter. I wonder when our country has participated in destroying somebody else's hometown or city? And how much responsibility do we have for their totally legitimate anger or sadness? 
will keep going. So what happens normally with refugees and migrants is they will remember things from where they come from. And quite often these days it's food and music. And you'll go, I, I have friends who, whose great grandmother was Italian, nonna. They can't speak Italian, but they can still cook Italian food. And they'll still listen to Italian music, but they have no idea what the words are. They don't care. It's their culture, it's their history. And that's where the people of Jerusalem are. And they're being asked to perform like circus animals. And they are angry. They're so angry that what they're saying is, God, if somebody were to take these, the children of these people and to kill them, they should be happy. What do we do with that as Christians? What do we do with that as a chirpy, cheerful, bubbly 19-year-old at university, as she was? I think we have a couple of privileges and a couple of responsibilities that come to us out of this. So the first privilege is to recognize that we don't only bring our joys to God. We don't only bring our happiness to God as if everything else is invalid, as if our tiredness and our sadness and our brokenness and our anger is not acceptable before God. It is. And we should be grateful for that. We shouldn't try and hide it or feel like because we're Christians we can never be angry. Someday being angry and sad and tired and broken is the only right response to the circumstances around us. Some days it's perfectly legitimate. And we can bring that to. But we also have a responsibility to speak against, sometimes, the results of those anger, that anger. Our reaction when we read that last verse, happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the stone, was at the very least awkwardness, something of a spiritual no, and that's good too. It's tricky for us because it's in the Bible. And we take the Bible seriously. And so we want to take everything that is in it seriously. I think if we don't take this seriously enough, we miss the point. Because if we don't take it seriously enough, we think that means it's okay to act that way. Rather, we need to take it very seriously and very seriously say, it's okay to bring anger before God, but we leave it before the cross, and we don't enact it on others. We don't enact our anger on, on those who are innocent. We don't enact our rage against those for whom it is not right. We leave it be with God. That's taking this profoundly seriously. So the central question of the psalm is the one where we didn't respond. I don't know if you noticed with the verse numbers. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The people of Jerusalem had been pulled out of their comfort zone. They had had their town, their city smashed. They were slaves. And they were being asked to sing a song. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I think the first thing we need to recognize is just because the environment is strange to us it does not mean that God has abandoned us. Sometimes... Sometimes we feel like maybe God's abandoned us. We don't feel the close presence of God. I've been there. We need to affirm that although the land feels strange and foreign, the presence of God is with us. And that's a great privilege. So when we sing the Lord's song, we do so knowing that the Lord is with us. The other thing about singing is that it works better if there's somebody singing near you. If you are, unless you're singing in the shower, 
singing by yourself, your voice will get lost. And you'll start to feel awkward and uncomfortable, as if you're alone and isolated. But if you sing with others around you, then your voice joins theirs and their voice joins yours. And we're making church. Church as it should be. Singing the Lord's song. Singing of the presence of God despite the troubles and difficulties in our lives. And we sing. Bringing before God our pain and our joy. Our brokenness and our willingness to reach out. Our anger and our desire to leave our anger at the foot of the cross. So that we can do the Lord's work in the world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.